look, it's showtime, everybody. It's called Bring It In. This is True Hoop, and we have David Thorpe and an empty bedroom. It's going to be a good show. <laughs> He's coming. Now wandering on to our very professional set is the great Thomas Beller. Um, Tom, I'm going to read your actual bio because it has more components than uh, one can keep in one's head. Um, he's the author of Seduction Theory. Uh, Seduction Theory, colon, stories. The Sleepover Artist, How to Be a Man, Scenes from a Protracted boyhead, boyhood, and J.D. Salinger, The Escape Artist, which won the New York City Book Award for Biography slash Memoir. His, his work has been reprinted in the Best American Short Stories, The Art of the Essay, and numerous other an anthologies. He's also edited four anthologies of essays. From 1990 to 2010, he edited Open City Magazine and Books. He's a longtime contributor to The New Yorker. He's written for The New York Times, Vogue, Town & Country, and The Three Penny Review, among others. He is an associate professor and director of creative writing at Tulane University. How about that? I'm tired from hearing it. What's going on? What are you doing on a basketball show? This is ridiculous. Oh, my God. You know, basketball is... Uh... A strangely huge part of my life, Henry. Yeah, it is. I was saying to David by way of introduction, um, a sort of behind the scenes introduction, I was like, look, David's son is around the age you graduated from high school. And I imagine is very often sweaty and wearing high tops when David encounters him, for instance, in their living room in a pandemic lockdown. I was saying to David that you, <laughs> your last name's Beller, but it might as well be Baller because I've <laughs> met you at the Met in Central Park and uh, Daniel Balud cafes and stuff um, where you are like, you're so, so, so committed to the game. Oh yeah, I'm wearing yeah. like a practice jersey. Right? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I was, that, that's kind of what I was looking forward to talking about with you guys, to be honest, was uh, yeah. this strange interval we're in. And by the way, thank you for giving me a reason to shave and put clothes on and things like here that. Here for you, we're here for you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Although I, I should mention, you know, as I was telling, that there's the door back there is a is like a sub curtain number one. You just don't know what's going to come through. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I wanted to just reflect on this weird era of life without basketball um, and talk to you guys. David, I, I should mention, was kind enough to, I hope it's okay, to meant to talk about this, put me in touch with a guy that he worked with kind of bringing up as a coach, I guess, uh, Ryan Pannone, who's now- He's been the, on the show. He's been on the show. The head coach of the New Orleans Pelicans G League mm -hmm. affiliate. And um, talking to him, meeting him was very interesting because that was a point of view I had not had before. I had the sort of fans point of view, the aspiring players point of view, the coaches point of view was interesting in some ways and it actually sounds like the most hardcore version of basketball immersion uh, mm. even beyond the writer point of view or the player point of view so we're all living without it now so i wanted to vent on that subject <laughs> you sent an email um i mean look we've all gotten emails that are very worrying you know over the last few weeks from friends in need or family members etc um i felt like this was a real cry for help. I'm totally honest. You said, I'm starting to get distressed about the lack of basketball. I don't mean watching basketball, although that too, I mean playing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been working on a piece about this. For one thing, it's been a strange uh, occasion to reflect on the relationship between being like a basketball obsessive who discovers true, true hoop. And Henry, when did you start writing your blog? When 2005. was that? So I must have found it within the first year. Oh, and, for sure. Yeah. And was reading it pretty avidly um, ever since. And so there's that kind of appetite for basketball, which is very focused on the professional game, the game as it's played at the highest levels, you know, getting into Coach Thorpe, talking about training techniques and how he, what he does with how we got Udonis Haslam into a 16 year career in the NBA and like what, how, what's, and then the relationship between being a fan and then taking that into your own life. And, uh, but for myself, you know, I call basketball my last vice, having given up other vices and I've become very aware. You don't have any others? You don't have any, there's nothing else you feel vice? No, I have others like, uh, <laughs> uh, 
I, another basketball podcast that I listen to is this, it's now been retitled, but it's now called, anyway, it has uh, Ben Golliver and Andrew yeah. Sharp, and it's a yeah. kind of Felix and Oscar dynamic. Yeah. And Sharp at one point made mention, he, he just keeps alluding to lying in bed at two in the morning reading basketball Twitter. All right. And he refers to that as being like sick and addicted, which I, I, I fastened onto that because it's a bit of a harsh way of putting it, but you know, there's a tremendous, personally, a, a tremendous appetite for reading about basketball, hearing what people are talking about. But playing basketball is the key vice is what I'm, so I've got other vices, basketball related and otherwise, but playing basketball to me functions the way that alcoholics are looking at five in the afternoon. Did you guys ever see this movie Burn After Reading, a Coen Brothers movie? Amazing, yeah. Do you, the, the scenes in that movie where John Malkovich, who's this like frustrated, waspy, fired ex-CIA alcoholic, who's very anal retentive and just has a complete freak out as the clock ticks towards five when he can make his first drink. And I'm realizing I have that relationship to pick up basketball. That doesn't sound safe. It's just that, you know, as the afternoon, as the work day, whatever, the afternoon starts moving towards the later part of the day, I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay to go play basketball soon. So what have you been doing? How do you handle that in the quarantine time? Well, it's been very difficult. Yeah. I don't have a hoop. Um, in the first days of quarantine, I started taking these late, late night drives to local pickup basketball courts in New Orleans to just take photographs of these night scenes. Oh, wow. And wow. That's like yeah, looking, was, that's like John Malkovich looking at the alcohol. <laughs> well, he got to drink it. I mean, this was yeah, that's my point. Quite like that. It would be more like John Malkovich going to the liquor store at night and peering through the, gla yeah. the glass of the closed store. So, and that was quite interesting just as an occasion to explore the city because I went to the places that I've been going to play and then I branched out and it actually became, I'll just tell you one anecdote, just if I may. Sure, New Orleans. One of the strange things about moving to New Orleans was realizing that um, the place that gave us David Duke, the Nazi, is, is just outside of New Orleans. Like the place, if you have to go to the Apple store or the restoration hardware, that's in this town called Metairie, which is right. next door. And it's in fact where the Pelicans and the Saints have their practice facility. It's a normal place, but that's the, those are the people that elected a Nazi as their state representative. And then, I mean, so I went out to that part of the city and to this amazing park where I was told by Google Maps there was a basketball court and it was beautiful. I brought my dog. It was like after midnight. It would have been deserted anyway. This was like extra deserted because it was early pandemic days and they had tennis courts and a softball field and a football field and a track and a handball, a playground, two baseball stadium, whatever, diamonds, no basketball courts. Oh, so no way. Where are the basketball courts? So I kind of said, okay, you know, the dog walked around on the field. It was very haunted and beautiful. Time to go home. But no, there was another basketball court nearby. Let's just take a look at that. It took me forever to find it because it was under the underpass. In other words, there's like an overpass over this neighborhood. And I was like, oh, it's in, it's in the streets right around the overpass. No, it was actually physically under, like if Dirk Nowitzki, there was like three courts, Dirk couldn't have shot up the last basket. <laughs> the overpass was coming down over the basket. And wow. it was haunted and strange. And I've been meaning to follow up and just be like, how did it happen that you had room for all these things? I mean, I don't want to fall into this Northeast in the South trap here. I just want, it was notable anyway. So, so the, that was the white sport scene. had a big, beautiful park in David Duke's town. And yeah, every, black sport I mean, it's, it's, it's unfair to tar the entire, all of Metairie as the yeah. place that elected David Duke, even if it's factually correct. Like, remember <laughs> Black Klansman? Did you guys see that? Yeah, of course. I, when I saw that movie just recently, uh, this, there's these scenes where he's, David Duke is pictured on the phone. Yeah. There, it's very grammatically similar from scene to scene. He's always in the same room. Yeah. Yeah. in the same kind of shot. It's the Apple store, I just learned. Well, basically, I, you know, <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, Jesus, man, that's 15 minutes from Uptown New Orleans. He's that room. Yeah. Anyway. Wow. Um, wow. How did we get to this? I don't know, but I want to make you tell more stories. Can you please um, just 
take take 45 minutes if you need to please with all of your storytelling powers just set the scene for me about the story of the white leather couch oh okay well let me back up and back yeah. away from yeah, this. I got because I'm going to mute myself. Well, you just, you just no, go no, to no, 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 no. This is go. it's going to be brief because what's what I was going to say. I like to say to the True Hoop world, I'm one of you. Greetings, and a big fan of Henry. And I was very excited to know that Henry really enjoyed something I wrote called the Two Thousand Dollar Popsicle, and considers it to be part of the larger basketball canon. Of there is the Two Thousand Dollar Popsicle. So good. So. I encourage you to go read that piece because I don't want to take it out of the, I don't know if this is on the screen. I think it is. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, it's in the New Yorker. They're not too, if, you're, if you go Beller Popsicle, New Yorker Popsicle, I've got a lock on the Popsicle beat. <laughs> and leave it at that because it doesn't, I don't want to turn it into just an anecdote, but I'm really glad that it resonated for Henry. And he actually, frankly, glad that he considers it a basketball story because basketball is a bit, um, it's a fleeting detail, but it is important. Oh, but the story can't work without it. There's, okay, so I'm going to consider that a successful dodge of my request to fill half an hour in a pandemic when we really need content. Um, I have other things to talk about. I want to talk about what I want, what I'm working on because the popsicle piece I wrote, what I'm working yeah. on, like I want to ask you guys. Okay. Questions, okay. okay, lay it on us. Well, um, let me put this to David. David, how are you handling the interval where not only do we not have, because it's life without basketball for all of us, but David, particularly you, maybe most of all, is a bifurcated problem. Problem one is, we don't have basketball to watch. We don't have this enormous amount of content that contextualizes what we're seeing. We're all fastened onto the Jordan documentary because it gives us something to hold on to and take apart. But the other absence is uh, playing basketball or coaching people who are preparing to play basketball. Um, you know, those first forays I took to the local hoops in New Orleans were really in early days and. Subsequently, they've physically taken the hoops off of the backboards as they have all over the country. Right. Which is intense because if you look at basketball from a pandemic point of view, it's one of the most non-safe things you could do, especially pickup basketball, where you can't, like, say, an NBA team could conceivably test every player, establish that they're not infected, quarantine them, and then you're good to go, you can practice all day. But any other sort of mix and match, and that's the whole point of pickup basketball in a way, is what you got, you know, and sort of rolling the dice in any given game. So I wanna know, David, how, you know, what's it like to be without this day-to-day -day practice, literally practice? Well, I was thinking about this, uh, Thomas, when you first were talking about what you're going through, and you mentioned Ryan Pannone, we're a little bit fortunate as coaches because, well, the, well, some of us anyway, who are always trying to learn, you don't really get that chance too often during the season, other than you can learn more about your own team maybe. Uh, so there's clinics constantly. I've done a couple myself where people all over the world can, can jump on Zoom and, and ask us questions or, or just watch. Uh, we're breaking down film. I'm working with players almost every day now actually using Zoom Judy and Henry first got me talking about this. We're talking about the screen sharing thing. So I, I took a player the other day and we studied Aaron Gordon's isolation defense. Become a much, he's become a good isolation defender on the perimeter for the Orlando Magic. And we've studied, I've, I've, I've studied G League players with them. And, and serious players can, you, if you watched the documentary last night, you heard Jordan talk about Rodman liked watching film. That, that's common. Like these guys don't want to get embarrassed, right? They're, and they want to win, right? That combination gets them into the film room. You just have to ask. Some of the guys that do it on their own, most you have to ask. And they say, yes, sir. And they can't get enough of it. So I've been able to do that every day. My, I, I'm lucky enough to have my son still here. He, uh, I'm not going to say too much yet, but it looks like he'll be playing in college next year at a very good place. 
I don't think he'll get in the game very much, but it, we're excited about the opportunity. So he almost daily comes to ask me to come shoot. He already has done that early this morning. He was, he was up at six this morning to get his homework done and he wanted to go shoot with me. So I get a chance to kind of scratch that itch, right? On the court with him. I don't do too much because I'm his dad, not his coach. And then at nighttime, I, I'm seeing my family probably more than I have ever in mm -hmm. April, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, we're trying to do family things as often as we can. Uh, it was, we did more of it when it first hit. We were watching Avengers movies every night because my, my daughter and I didn't see them. When they first came out, I, I saw them with my son. So, but, but we are getting better as coaches now. I think, I think players and fans have it worse. As right. coaches, we can, we can work on our craft more now and be better when, when the games come back on, you know? You know, one of the things that has really struck me about the now completely forgotten and derided uh, horse competition yeah. that tiny well, that went away in a hurry didn't it yeah i mean but let's keep that alive because one of the things i thought was fascinating about that which is i guess an extension of our zoom society that we now live in where we get to see henry's attic and whatever um yeah that <laughs> such a stylish spot um life is um, rich now you can see my attic <laughs> it's beautiful so uh the courts that the players, the NBA players were on was interesting. For one thing, just never mind the internet connection, it makes you realize how much of NBA basketball is showmanship and, and production value and the excitement of the crowd. But it was just, just interesting, like Mike Conley, damn, you know, what a beautiful gym he had. You know, he's gonna be great when he comes back. These <laughs> other guys earlier in their career, uh, you know, Trey Young's garage, I don't think he could even back up far enough to get out of his range. He couldn't really push his three-point shot because uh, Zach Levine, who's made some money now with the kind of brand, Zach Levine's pine trees at the outside of the perimeter of his Seattle era, I assume he's somewhere in Seattle, and, you know, they were so new. They were just put in by the landscapers. That's and exactly. All what I took from this was like, oh, this is some landscape artist convinced him this would be a privacy screen. And maybe one day it will be, yeah. but it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't want to plant mature trees. He's a young player, young, young trees for the young player. But right, right. But, of, you know, we understand through mythology and to some extent personal experience, but mostly mythology, basketball mythology that, you know, whatever you take a mill crate and nail it to the wall and there's your basket you can, you can practice if there's a will to practice you can practice but i just couldn't help thinking oh wow you know these environments affect i would think how much you can get into it another thing that's a coaching issue if i may say this is a hell of a digression but i've been going to these soccer games that steve nash puts on in downtown Manhattan, he's been doing yeah. it forever. <laughs> Began as this amazing guerrilla theater thing where no one knew about it and just by word of mouth, people would come flood. Now it's a more corporate, pre-planned, I think televised. I think Mark Stein plays in that. Mm -hmm. Does he? Yeah. Um, I, and the I, last time I saw Tom, I think last time I saw you. Well, yeah, we were there together. That's at right. that game, we're basically like, oh. if you don't, can I tell the story of your daughter, yes. Tom? You might, okay, so. Look at me, I'm like, I'm like in agony just for that <laughs> <laughs> So we, 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 we have something of a plan. It's not a good plan, but we're both going to be at this thing. And he brings his children. And, it's, and the amazing thing about this event is, you know, we're standing one foot behind the baseline. And it's all famous people out there. Playing. Some of them are top European soccer professionals. Some are from South America. And some are NBA players. And some of them are really good. And some of them are not so good, right? And your, Tom's daughter plays soccer and has certain standards. And I think maybe just didn't want to come that day. <laughs> and by the time, <laughs> and basically someone whiffs a pass right in front of her. And she's just like, basically turns to Tom and is like, we have to go because this blows. <laughs> like This is just not <laughs> high enough quality for me. And then Tom basically is like, Henry, you can, maybe you have something useful to yeah, say. You're a little <laughs> further along in the parenting <laughs> university. Uh, How old was your daughter at that point? I, it was last summer. She was last summer. 12. Yeah. Okay. So I'm struggling. I don't know what to say, but I end up saying something that I now think I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased Damn I said, I, I, I've referenced it since. Like, 
what I said to her was something like, knowing the professional players out there and non-professional players, right? Right. Um, I was like, I think if you look out there looking for people doing a bad job, you will find that. But I think of people doing an amazing job, you will find that too. So it's kind of a choice you get to make. Like, what are you going to take from this, right? And I think that's actually life. That's how it goes. Like, if you're looking for terrible, terrible news, it's always there, right? And if you're looking for good news, it's always there too. And, you know, it's, it's never how you want it to go, but it's just yeah. a big, giant celebrity soccer game in Chinatown. That's what life is. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, let me take it. You're framing it, I think, almost too much, your comment too much in terms of the sport and her remarks. She doesn't really play soccer. She's athletic, but she's not a soccer player. Oh, I got a different impression. In a serious okay. way. Okay. It was more of like an emotional posture, like dad has dragged me to this thing. We've seen it. We've done this before. We had better seats last time type of thing. <laughs> pure brattiness. And I was so mortified. Also, her instinct for undermining me is so fantastic. So I was genuinely excited to see Henry. She looked, she must have been like, my dad is too happy. Like the meter went. Oh, she needs to bring you down a little bit? Yeah, she just yeah. needed. Like, so now we have this problem. This vocal, it's kind of was funny, but so you're talking, but you're making it too much about the sport, her appreciation or lack thereof of this. this it wasn't about soccer, it was about okay. life. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> life is a celebrity soccer game. You're going to either just find it disappointing or kind of fun. Yeah. And it was helpful, yeah. sort of. Yeah. You I know, get back. I, can I oh, share okay. a very inappropriate memory? Which oh, this is all you know, edit this, so. this is the form for that. <laughs> how do I say the guy, uh, Amin Al Hassan? Is that how I say his yeah. name? I mean, yeah. Interesting, you know, who I met entirely through your devising, Henry, and your true loop activities. Uh, he was in a, standing near us or next to us, I guess, and was in a funny mood and was mm -hmm. talking about, I think Lol Deng was playing yeah. on the field. Oh, and, oh, I do remember this. Yeah. And he was somehow got onto a little riff about um, the sense that how old is Luol Deng really? Yeah. And this question was always thrown at the African player. Like, like Dikembe could have been 80 years old by the time he can't even showed up. At the, like that sense of nebulousness. And he, he complained about that. He, he was not so, happy. So Amin and I, you know, I, I feel like Amin has the purest heart and I love Amin and we're, we go way back. And, um, and we argue all the time. This was one of those ones where I was super pissed off at Amin because I started that. I made a comment not because Luol Deng is from the Sudan, as is Amin. That's not why I said this. I said this because I had a source with direct knowledge who suggested that Luol Deng was among those humans on planet Earth who has not legit paperwork. That maybe he's a little older than you think because somewhere back down the channel and getting to where you got to, somebody fake some paperwork. There's a lot of reason to do that, right? If, I don't know if it's true or not, but if you look at his game, there were a, there were a bunch of years where he was like 27 but looked like it played like he was 31 or <laughs> right like um it, it it wasn't something you could just immediately discard at some point i mentioned this in passing to amin who didn't take the time to ask any follow-up questions it just decided i was being whatever the word would be for someone who would think that everyone from africa fakes their paperwork <laughs> right like yeah so he was going off on this thing and i'm like come on like come Wait, on so, so i don't think i so this was in response to something you said right yes. then yeah cool <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you a, a little Luol Deng side story. Uh, he was a client of mine for a long time and, and, had, and one of the sweetest men I've ever known in my life uh, as, a, as a player. Luol escaped the Sudan, as some of you guys know, because his dad is actually working in the government. And right. when the government kind of turned hostile towards uh, people who look like Luol's dad, they had to escape with their lives and he got them to Egypt. He couldn't go initially, but Luol initially lived in Egypt. And then eventually the dad was able to get him to Britain, right? I don't remember where exactly. Brixton, Brixton, London. Brixton, London, okay. Brixton. Yeah. He was outside London, yeah. So, yeah. so, so Luol told me a story. I was with Luol and one of his brothers who also played at, who played at Connecticut. And Luol said he remembered being in class in Brixton in London. And he, got an answer, he raised his hand to answer a question and got it wrong. And he kept waiting for the teacher to come over to beat him with a stick. Mm. As one does. Which is what they did in Egypt. Every, every time he got something wrong, his classmates didn't get beat, he did. Okay. So I've heard the story. I've asked Luol about his age. I've coached 
more than one player who I'm certain, well, one of them admitted to me that he was older than what he has said. He wasn't from Africa. But Luol claims that isn't the case. He's like, yeah, I, coach, I ran for my life, basically, when I left the yeah. Sudan. And I said, I don't even care. Knowing that you got beat in Egypt when you got things wrong, hmm. like, whatever, I, we'll get over it. And I trained Luol. And there was a time where he was very, very athletic. I realized that's not Henry's point anyway. Um, his point was more towards how Amin reacted. But um, I just remember, you know, basketball has got so many incredible stories. Yeah. Uh, from what these, you know, Dennis Rodman, and we've talked about this a little bit. They, they only showed Henry a little bit last night in the documentary of what he went through. Uh, but Thomas, I want to say something real quick about your passion for playing pickup. You, were, you made me think of something. When I train players oftentimes, it's around lunchtime. Uh, sometimes maybe it's 10 to 11, 30, whatever, in just a rec center. Typically, it's some kind of community center, rec center. I use a lot of them. And most of them in the summertime have lunch leagues for men our age, 35 to whatever. And I love this so much, uh, Thomas. If they get there early, they love watching my – I mean, I've had some very famous pros on the court. I've also had some not-so-famous pros, but still very talented players. And they like to peek in and watch what we're doing. I don't close – practice they're allowed to watch but once their pickup game starts man they don't care if I freaking have I could have Allen Iverson in the gym I have it they wouldn't care I've had Jason Williams he's pretty fun to watch they don't care they're there to play ball and you know, it's funny can I, I interrupt love you to say they, just, they don't care they're not fans anymore they're players I love so that there's now extinct physical structure in Manhattan called basketball city they yeah. actually have a new basketball city or it's not new anymore, but it's on, they had the, the first NBA awards where it's a big space on the east side, but it yeah. used to be a, a bubble on the west side next to Chelsea Piers. Yeah, um, I remember. And I would go play there and I was in a league. In fact, Henry, the jersey that you mentioned I was wearing when I met you to walk around and go to the museum, I believe was from a basketball city league. So mm -hmm. I'm playing in my, whatever that, whatever, however you want to characterize that league. Uh, and it's a late game. And in the court over there, there's another game. And at some point, I'm running up and down in my game. And I look over there, and I was like, those guys are pretty good. It wasn't immediately apparent what was going on. I just was like, they're pretty good. And since this is apropos of your Jason, mentioning Jason Williams, at some point, I realized, wait a second. It, it was the other Jason Williams. I have this right, right? The net who shot mm -hmm. his chauffeur. Correct. Sorry yeah, to make that forward. be this yeah. defining. Henry, I think Henry wrote an article. Right here in this county where I live is where that shooting took place. Right. So, I I'm mean, not, but anyway, this was before that. Right. Um, it was him, Lloyd Daniels. Wow. Wow. And another NBA, current or former NBA player. And it was, I'm pretty sure, I know that Jason Williams was definitely, it was an NBA star at that point. Yeah. And... I think Lloyd Daniels was still hanging around like with the Spurs or something. And the other, yeah. uh, but it was just a funny moment to go running back and forth. And then like, there was another game over there. And then at some point I was like, that guy just dunked or they're going pretty quickly or somehow it dawned on me. And this actually is a, a source of total fascination for me endlessly is the fantasies one can have about like, well, I'm good. I'm pretty good. Or let me ref take it out of the first person eye. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you can have a player who's really good, best player on his team. They get to the next level and they're the middle of the pack, but the best player on that team, when they get to the next level, are themselves hanging on for dear life. Then you have all the way to the point you have college stars, guys used to be playing on TV and being famous, can't make a team in the NBA. It's just such a thin onion. It's so interesting to me how that all works. There's a, I'm done. So David talked about how he can scratch his coaching itch a little bit through Zoom, basically, right? And, and other similar products. Yeah. Um, and then, but then Thomas is having this different emotion, right? And part of me, I, I'm, 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 I'm also writing about a little bit this same topic. I, Tom will write something way better than I will, but I'm, I'm going to publish mine first. It'll be tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so that I got that going for me. What topic is that? So, but I'm referencing this book, which came out a long time ago. Cool. Uh, his name's I... Thomas McLaughlin. It's a super academic kind of Lift dive. It up a little. I want the byline. I want the byline. Higher, higher, yeah. higher, uh, higher. Stop. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's really like a, 
it's like a PhD thesis, you know, pub self published or whatever. Um, State University of New York of New York Press. Um, but this guy really goes into like what's really happening. What is the emotional experience of like those guys that are watching for their waiting for their game to start when Dave is training NBA players? Where like they have something happening in their hearts that has to happen that doesn't happen by spectating, right? They have to participate in this thing. This guy goes way deep on how it's like dancing or like going to a nightclub and like, and it's maybe even a little, it's, it's permission to be for men to be physical with men in ways that we don't often get in regular life. Right. And um, I'm reminded of uh, the beat generation. They're saying like the invention of the car made it so that like two men, Allen Ginsberg and um, blanking on uh, Jack Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, right? Uh, like yeah. they can sit in a car, two men, um, I think one of whom was heterosexual, one of whom was homosexual, and they can spend like 15 hours having very meaningful conversations. And it's socially acceptable because they're facing the same way in a car. Whereas yeah. before the car, you'd be in a restaurant for 15 hours and that's not okay. It's too weird. You're also it's describing guys watching sports on television when you're talking about the car. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So part of, and, and then this, I, I, I don't know, if, I, I've never been one of these people, but there are these people who just need to dance or love to dance, need to go to a nightclub and like sweat and be with the people and touch people and have people bump into you. And like all of those emotions work exactly the same with pickup basketball, right? Like the lighting's different, whatever, but like, but like, I feel like Thomas needs to like be out there. Like, I don't, I'm kind of too old for this. My body doesn't agree with it anymore, but like there it was a long period of my life where if something terrible happened, and actually, he talks a lot about the, the movie version of Basketball Diaries, which was pretty bad. Um, Basketball Diaries was um, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, yeah. starred in it. Um, uh, little side Carol. detour in a story that doesn't need it, but they shot it in the park where Tomka Square Park, when I lived on the edge of it, which was also when um, uh, Rent was set there at the same time, blah, blah, blah. But um, they were, it was closed for a while because they were making Basketball Diaries there with Leonardo DiCaprio every day. But um, there's a death and there's grieving in that movie. And then there's like this kind of bunch of bad kids who are roving around, drug addicted, violent, um, trying to cope with this death. And, um, but then there's a, the, the, the healing is basketball. They go play pick up basketball in the rain. And it's like, and, and this is a way that a tattered soul can kind of knit itself back together is with this movement and cutting and these ancient things. And, and this is what Tom needs. <laughs> we gotta get Tom that. Tom, yeah, would you like to speak now? <laughs> yeah. I just want to say that um, <laughs> I think you've made this too positive and inspiring and made it about healing and dancing and stuff. My take on it is much more atavistic and violent and negative. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. <laughs> you know, for me, this is a scenario where you're going to like risking death. You're going to die. They're going to, you're going to be humiliated. All of my formative experiences as a pickup basketball player, as a, I should be specific, as a not very skilled, not very athletically talented, tall, skinny, white guy playing in a... We should be clear. Like, How freaking tall are you? tall. Not that tall. You're pretty by tall. By NBA standards. Six, five and a half. Six, five and a half in a pickup game is tall. Well, anyway, <laughs> the playground basketball, I was just... Um, I can't believe I kept playing play, but it amazes me when I think about what I went through as a younger person. Even now to this day, I, I, I'm like, uh, if, I'm, if I show up at a playground where their people are pretty good, they're very glad to see me because I look like they're gonna dunk on me. And they're right, like, but I, I bring out the best in other players. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's two people on a poster. So, <laughs> but, but, I mean, my, I, my source of pride is that I'm just barely good enough to be able to play, to be on the court with people that good. May I just tell you quickly my great, the highlight of my basketball life? Absolutely. So I'm 19 now. I'm playing Division three basketball, but I'm in a summer league with good players in Manhattan, downtown. It's the mid-80s. A period of time, by the way, which two very widely watched documentaries have taken us back to obviously the Jordan documentary, but also the Beastie Boys documentary, mm -hmm. both start in the early 80s and move forward from there. So Walter Berry, mm. just prior to when he actually played at St. John's, when he was just this legend, 
And it's funny to mention Lloyd Daniels because there's a similar street ball legend, um, except Walter Berry didn't get shot. Walter Berry walks in with an entourage, um, suits up and is playing in a game on the other team. And I'm in the game and I'm going to guard Walter Berry. Whoa. And he's going to guard me. How that tall is he? For, what's that? How tall is he? Six eight, maybe six seven, six eight. In sneakers, yeah, maybe like six seven, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Ever since, I mean, you know, we're all. That's this is another topic. The the real height of basketball players, but oh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you should say yeah. you're six ten for the record. You should just to fit in. <laughs> yeah. Depends on the situation. So. <laughs> What I want to relate to you is my intense excitement and fear that went into this very short episode, the highlight of which, God knows how I got here. I guess I just want to tell you, I'm on a podcast with my favorite we basketball hear. people. Yeah. I have the ball. I guess I have a rebounder. I somehow have the ball down low. There's Walter Berry standing next to me. And there's the basket. And I go into a series of head fakes that was like, it should have been a meme. It was like a meme before they existed. It was just like 500 head fakes in a row. <laughs> and the entire time, Walter Berry, whose resting expression at the time was, I mean, this is the reason I even mentioned the BC Boys is there's this whole like aesthetic of street basketball, blackness to be frank, that was um, really violent and intense. And Walter Berry had this look on his face, just this like basic level of contempt and self-confidence. And he just watched me head fake him for like five minutes without any <laughs> facial expression. He just was like, just mild disgust while I frantically pump faked. And then when I sort of decide like, he's, he, he's not gonna do anything because that would be too, he's not gonna flatter me by even attempting to do anything. Yeah. And then I shot the ball. Did you make it? Yeah, we got to know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm pretty sure I did, but that's not the part that's vivid in my memory. The part that's vivid in my memory was his face. Yeah. And what was interesting was years later, well into the Nick nightmare, so into, in the 2000s, I saw him in Madison Square Garden. I was aware that his career had gone to Italy. He'd been one of the earlier Italian league, I mean, I guess these D'Antoni played there, so it goes way back. But he, he made a whole career and a livelihood in Italy. He had this fantastic waist-length fur coat, so he was like a kind of furry porcupine figure. And he was beaming, and I went up to him, and I said, Barry, we need you out here now. Come on. And he was so joyous, actually, in that moment. Uh, so that other face of him as like a 40-year-old who's lived in Italy for 15 years and taken on some of this thing, whatever you get there, versus this other, like Walter Berry from New York in 1983 or whatever it was. Sorry, sorry. No, this that. is actually another huge thing about basketball. Underrated, David will talk about this more knowledgeably than I will, but like basketball takes Ryan Pannone from- All over the world. Florida to where has he been and Walter Berry to Italy and like it actually yeah. does like open minds. Like it does really connect people, it really does. Wait, wait, where, 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 I mean, oh, you no. say no. But it's <laughs> hi. The door, the door. <laughs> it is what you make of it, Tom. It can yeah. be. This, by the way, is the terrible. This is the famous person from the Steve yeah. Nash soccer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love you. Oh, wait. There's another. There's another floor up there. She's going to the attic. Very What's clever. going on? Very clever. Let's just keep it local to our physical space. <laughs> Basketball doesn't just take people around. Uh, there's a little bit of class warfare in a way that, that's different. Um, I was thinking about that when Thomas was telling a story about the look of complete disdain on Walter Berry's face when he saw this dude faking him when he wasn't going after any of them. When, when I was in 1984-85, I was a college student, and back then, Fort Lauderdale was the mecca for spring break. And most of my fraternity brothers were from there. So there were two outdoor courts on – the beach that everyone in America came to for spring break. They made a movie called spring break on that beach. And on the two courts, regular full courts, there was the game for anyone that just wanted to go play basketball. And then there was the game for the basketball players. So because I was a serious player in high school for four years, whatever, and I was six feet tall, one like I was four eleven, 
I would play on the court with the guys that knew how to play. And it didn't matter what color you were or how rich you were or poor you were. Either you could play or you couldn't. And if we didn't have enough guys, and this was never me, most of my attorney brothers were not good basketball players. But they liked to play, and they were huge Knicks fans. I was in a Jewish frat. They were all Knicks fans because their parents were from New York, and Bernard King was their guy, right? And he loved him. So they would want to go shoot. And if we only had eight players to play on the good court, I never am the one who said no. They did. Either you could play or you couldn't. We played four and four with guys that could play before I brought in someone that was a chucker. If you didn't know how to read a screen or set a screen mm -hmm. or if you were going to take the wrong shot on game point, you murdered the whole game. Yeah. And I love that. Not to mention you get injured with people who don't know how to play basketball. Absolutely. In fact, that's exactly what they would say. They would kick you off the court. If they thought you could play and you couldn't, you're off. You're on the other court. And I, I, it was the few things. I didn't have a lot of confidence in, in myself. Uh, at that age, but I knew I could play good enough to at least be just fine. It was an outdoor court, so it was windy, so I wasn't the best shooter, which I normally was a pretty good shooter, but I knew how to play, and that's all that mattered. So those were – I lived on those courts. Henry, when you described Thomas and his high tops and his hair, yeah. that was me for eight yeah. hours a day during spring break. It wasn't about drinking and chasing girls, whatever. I lived at my buddy's house at his, with his parents at night. All we yeah. did was play ball all day. It was great. Well, there's that – when you say – you know how to play like when you moment by moment if you were to like freeze a game like what that means is 10,000 different things like yeah, correct. I always think about my dear friend he owns that house right there uh, Travis we have played a lot of basketball together through the years and he's a great guy and really hard he plays really hard and you can win a lot with Travis on your team but he has this one habit and he would crack up that I'm telling this on this show but um the ball goes down low he'll go get it but then he pivots with his head stuck out, which means Ooh. Travis gets hit in the head all the time. Yeah. And we're frequently back, this is a long time ago now, stopping games because he's like, ah, like his neck hurts, his back hurts. And, and part of me is like, like, you just don't, you can't spin your head around, right? That's one. There's 10,000 more, like yeah. little things you do on the court or like if the screen's going this way and, and the guy's curling that way, like, there's a certain way that the two of us have to defend that, right? And, like, if you're playing with an athlete who's not a basketball player, then, like, like, oh, buddy, come on. Like, or, or if I cut, you know, back door, they're like, you got to look and see if we're getting the – you know, we're going to make this little magic together, right? Like, these are, like – there's a whole giant set of knowledge, which is like a dance, frankly, where it's like, you know, there's certain ways that we move, which is why it's fun. Right. Well, can I – this is a, a good moment for me to just finish my thought – yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> well, but, and it's so rare that that happens, so let's just cherish this. But when I was saying, uh, wait, the door, the door, the door. Thank you. Wave. Hi. We're okay. Hi. This is the new, this is the new business meetings now. Uh, go on. No. When Gerard says game, recognize game in the comments, um, he means when your daughter waved to me. That's what he's talking about. Right. I'd like to point out that the, my little sign that says on air is now like stuck in the door over the detail. I also heard her say, I know when you said the door. Mm -hmm. I've heard that tone a lot. Yeah. It's been yeah. a lot. But listen, the thought that I'm trying to finish is, Henry, in your beautiful, inspiring way of finding the positive and accentuating the positive, I just want to say that for me, pickup basketball is an intensely negative, terrifying <laughs> fraught event and I often feel like not unlike the way people relate to drinking or bars and things if I have a good day the likelihood I'm going to play well in my afternoon basketball pickup is lower than if I have a bad if I have a terrible day mm. I'm going to come out there on fire and I'm going to be amazing and I feel like everybody is working mm. through that so that's a lot of expelling of hostility negative energy anger it just looks like an arena for the expression of anger in, in an artful, somewhat contained way. So that would be my take. And those mm. Tompkins Square courts, at the time you're discussing, were the scene of some of that stuff. There used to be a good um, but a series of half-court games. I was just yeah. there last summer. They've renovated it. It's different now. There's a, these nice full courts where there were some good games, actually. But it, when I was there, they were half-court things. Yeah, I played half-court there, strictly half-court there. Um, okay, wait, this is a perfect time to bring up this thing that I, I just had this sort of shocking memory. Um, 
I was a big, I was like a, a, an organizer figure of a game here in town for years at the Catholic church a long time ago. I wasn't, organ- I wasn't like on the lease or anything, but I was like one of the people who'd make the emails and phone calls and make it happen. And, um, and we had a good vibe. It wasn't the best basketball, but everybody was friendly and it was reliable and they'd show up on time and they'd bring their 10 bucks. And, you know, there's a certain like, you know, there's a thing you could rely on there, right? And then every now and again, there'd be a visitor, which was allowed, but the visitor wouldn't quite get the vibe and it would threaten the vibe a little bit. And I remember at one point, and I was basically like, they just number one cheerleader, great job to both teams, like super happy to be there, joyous as can be, until... I would also be the one to find myself yelling at somebody for being a dick. <laughs> like that was also me. Um, but uh, I remember this one time I'm standing here with this guy, Mike, who was a great player. He's over here quiet. And I'm talking to this new guy who's from a different town. He's, he's tall like you and he's good like you, but he, um, he had a thing he would do with the ball frequently where you would just mm. hear the elbow like whistling by your temple, right? Like, or, or whatever. Like it was, and so as the game, we're between games and I'm like, hey, like, you know, like, you know, we don't want to have like a head injury here today, right? It's not going to be fun. Like if you get an extra bucket for your team out of like sending one of us to the hospital, like bad trade, right? Like, and, and the guy's kind of like, oh, what are you talking about? So then I start to explain a little more. And then Mike's just like, he knows what he's doing. And I just had this moment of like, this is a pickup versus organized basketball thing. Like, in organized basketball, you can for sure win games if, you, if the ref doesn't catch it. If everybody's scared, you're going to elbow them in the head. It's excellent winning strategy. In pickup, there's no ref. And you're not fooling anybody. Like, Mike's right. right. Like, he knows what he's doing. We know what he's doing. Like, and in a way, I think pickup is this organism that keeps itself a little bit above board. Whereas, yeah. whereas with uniforms and refs it actually gets a little dirtier the more competitive it gets um anyway that's that's my deep thought on that what do you think yeah i i like it i i, I just want to compare it if you didn't watch probably the jordan doc last night did you see it thomas the two episodes last night i actually had to miss for some complicated reasons having to do with but uh, a chunk of episode three but i got most of both episodes so one thing you'll see more so in these last night than you did last weekend um was just some of the of the crazy creative shots Jordan could make as just a pure bucket getter. One of, one of the you know, best all time, all bucket getters, Durant, George Gervin, Michael Jordan, Blake Griffin, they're creative. That didn't come from drills. I've said this all along. I'm supposed to want, you know, the guy that maybe kind of just created this skill development business everyone has now, but <laughs> I'm the one who's saying you got to play more games. Like, I don't think what we do is the answer. You've got to get creative. And so all those things, I'm telling you now, if you ask Michael Jordan, which I would, how many of those shots that you made in games had you made before? I think it would say all of them. But normally they would just say, well, for them, their, their games are pickup in a sense. They play so many of them. But when growing up before that, they played 20 some odd games a year at Carolina and 20 some odd games a year in, in, in high school. But I guarantee you played hundreds of games. Two on two, three on three, one on one, four on four, five on five where you just got creative. And so just to finish the thought, uh, uh, Henry has talked and other people have talked about how in a pandemic, we, can, we get creative, the species, our species can get creative. And there's stories of other works, you know, works of art that have come during a pandemic. I'm wondering now- All, all Tom, very depressing to hear, by the way, if you're actually trying to do something. Right, right. It, it, Henry, uh, uh, Thomas, so what you're missing, these players are dying because they can't get out there and do their craft and their creation. Uh, I, I don't know how it's gonna affect what they're doing going forward. I wish some of them had other avenues to let that out because they probably create something pretty amazing because pick up basketball and playing, it is artsy. It is, it is a creative process that they're being completely stunted at now. We might see really amazing basketball if we do get back just because it's dying to bust out, you know? Right. Or we might see terrible basketball because everyone's so out of shape. But I have a question. For sure of that, yeah. I have a question to you guys and and maybe even you, uh, Coach, particularly. So with the Jordan documentary and other things that we've just seen because they're only just running reruns of older basketball. Right. One thing that – this is a very microscopic matter, but I thought you might have a take. Michael Jordan was one of the last players to do a move that seemed to be much more common 
going back to the 70s, Dr. J, George, I don't know about George Gervin, but uh, Will Chamberlain, and that is to take the ball. Yeah, the one hand And to move it around. I love that. In that sort of taunting way. Like, I have this ball. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you, I feel like I never see that in the NBA level anymore. It's Jordan is like that. When I saw some of those clips, and he was doing a bit of that, like, what? They're not even one handed ball fakes. They're sort of shows. They are, they are one handed ball fakes. Yeah, they are. But here's why because in the rules then, if you're got the guy you were guarding didn't have the ball and he was standing in Timbuktu, you had to stand next to him, right? The court was playing, the game was playing in a much smaller space, but you still couldn't leave the guy you were guarding until the ball cr cr crossed a certain threshold. Unless you, again, the, the guy guarding the ball is different. So these guys were in a lot more space. Now I teach something very different. Now I teach, if you can't see all five defenders in your purview, in your vision, assume one of them is on your ass. So when you're going for a layup and you beat your guy and you think you're wide open, assume here comes someone coming to block it and they're six foot nine and really athletic. Always assume that. That wasn't the case nearly as much back then. You couldn't come from out of the area because you were too far away. You couldn't leave to help until the ball crossed. Oh, that you're saying people are not waving the ball around because the double is much closer. Not just double, just people around. You can shade towards someone much more often, oh. and everyone's got seven foot wingspans. I'm not even kidding. It's yeah. crazy how many seven wingspans he has. So just because you've got your guy and you think you're open, you're not. There's someone nearby ready to flick out, which is why we talk about spacing so much in our terms of our X and O uh, scheme. Is we've got to give these guys more space because the helper is longer and more athletic than ever before in human history. Do, do okay, you think I mean, I'm, I'm, am I imagining this though that that visual, the a guy in the low post or the high post, yeah, getting there with the ball, doing yeah. like this, this, you know, Jokic does one that. Hand. Yeah, Jokic does that. Jokic does that, but he's seven feet tall. Right. And it's that's one of the reasons it's so fun to watch, actually, because yeah. Jokic is like some giant pudgy George Gervin. <laughs> but don't we we all understand that that move is is play acting like an adult with a child yeah right? no, no, no. what you it's, do with a two-foot version tall of walter berry's expression yes. it's, it's a it's yeah. a mind game it's like yes. i have contempt for you you want yeah. this you can't have <laughs> yeah. it it's mine yeah. it's yeah. mine that's good i like that contempt yeah uh, and I just act, to finish the yeah. thought on the documentary i hate how violent the game was this is something I'm sure Henry will talk about at some point. It's one of the failures of David Stern. Like, this was awful, awful basketball. Awful. For all this talk of trying to create superstars. I wonder why he let it happen. I think I've even said this on the show. We didn't bash Picasso across the face as he painted. Right? Or Stevie Wonder, as he wrote music. Why are we smacking Pippen and Jordan all the time and acting as if that's good? It's I hate I hated watching those things. It's it's the worst part about it. It's actually, I looked at my watch and it's almost noon. I'm so, I apologize. Uh, we are over time. Dave, uh, just, Tom, use your just radio. really just very effective. Just way going, way. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'd spent yeah. the part of the year that had NBA basketball to think about, looking at and thinking about Zion Williamson. Yeah. And, I came across just as I was coming upstairs this fascinating artifact from just a couple of years ago oh. when we were in a different world. One of the great uh, scout, one of the one of the more notable scowlers. And this media guy from 2017-18 has DeMarcus and AD on the cover, but the inside is actually mostly DeMarcus. It's all <laughs> wow. they're pushing, I think, I don't know what the thought was. And I just wanted uh, mm. It's not that long ago, and I was like, wow, things really move fast. Yeah, it's a fluid, fluid season every year. It really is. Yeah, wow. Are we going to really get Gerard on, Henry? Yeah, we need to get Gerard. Uh, Tom, Tom, one of the traditions of the show, maybe the only tradition of the show, is that Gerard Hector joins us on video to raise the quality of the questions at the end of the show. <laughs> I don't know about that so much. What's up, guys? Coach, really quick, do you think – Harden is the evolution of that. He doesn't ball show the way Jordan does because of the, the closeness you mentioned, but in the way that he does those deceptive shows at the top of the key and gets you to foul him out there. Yeah, he's, in, he's an artist at getting fouled for sure, but what your point is right. You, ball protection is something we probably stress as much as any single thing in our gym. Everyone's long as heck. 
They're watching film all the time. They know if you're going to expose the ball, they're going to get a hand on it. I broke it down onto the Kupo's spin, and I've helped players get a late, a late in the possession deflection or steal because he's going to spin. When he protects it well enough, you foul him, which we don't want to do. But, yeah, the, the game, the defenders are better now than ever before. Back then, they just punched you. They weren't playing great defense, <laughs> typically, like they are now. I mean, obviously, uh, of course. Tom, you mentioned something interesting uh, earlier on in your discussion. Uh, obviously, you know, as I said, game recognized game. So there's a, a way in which, you know, color and all those things don't really matter. But, you know, in many ways, basketball is inherently a black game, right? So when when did you all, because all three of you play pickup and where you play, I know you played a lot of black guys. Like, when did you realize, like, oh, <laughs> like, I'm out here with a bunch of black guys. Like, were there those kind of things that happened to you in your mind where you were like, Okay, this is, this is a little different. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly my epiphany. I had a very strangely distinct moment when I started to be interested in basketball. It was around seventh grade, and I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan near a Riverside Park, and there was mm -hmm. and still is a court on 76th Street that – over the years has had really good run. It's now like most New York City basketball courts, a shadow of its former self in terms of basketball yes. for reasons that is another discussion. I was there but, recently, yeah, not great. <laughs> not great, but, but I was going out in winter break of seventh grade by myself to bounce a ball. And I remember these winter escapades kind of vividly. And then winter turned to spring and I've written about all this, this these three guys. Um, anyway, three, the three local kingpin, basketball kingpins, Black, uh, Otto Graham, shout out to Otto Graham, who I only learned his name years later, but he had a sweatshirt. This is 1977. It said Funk Mob. So it's me, now suddenly me and those three guys. It's warmed up a little bit. They're just shooting around. And I looked over there and they were, you know, I was 12. They must've been in their early twenties, but they looked very grown up. And that was my, you're asking like, when did this dawn on me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you didn't I feel mean. like you were in the funk mob. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I moved from Oregon, Oregon um, to yeah. New York city in 1991. And, you know, just had to play basketball. I didn't know how to survive in an apartment with like, Everything about it was very, actually first a dorm room was so constricting. Like I felt like I did not know how to exist in Manhattan um, without some fresh air or some like whatever the thing is that we love about pickup basketball and um, didn't find it for the first year of college and was like kind of a wreck. I mean, we would play sometimes at the NYU like sports center, Cole's sports center on Houston, but um, it was lame. Um, finally moved to the East Village and started playing there, but that's where I was like, yeah, it was, I mean, the East Village in, in that time was not like a, any color neighborhood. It was like, right. you know, every color neighborhood, yeah. yep. as was the game. But I mostly I was just like, I don't give a shit. Like, you got a problem with me because I'm white or whatever. <laughs> like, I still got to try to put that ball in that hoop. And I still got to try to run over here and do this. And you know that. And we all know that, right? Like, <laughs> like we're going to hear things that will be shocking. And maybe there'll be a little violence on the edge or whatever. And it, some of it will be racially directed or whatever actually i later learned by the way did you know this that like if you have nowhere to go when you're leaving rikers one of the places that the bus would drop you is tom was tom Square park at that time um, do what just oh that's a that's where you're going no you're you've been released you're free now but like if you don't have like here's the address where i'm right. going to go or right. here's my bus there was a bus and like that's why there would be moments of the week when that game would get very violent i was about to say when the game got much better suddenly <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I'd, I'd but, um, like to shout out Jared and answer your question though, just to elaborate for a second. Um, the people who've been most physically violent towards me and 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 explicitly hostile to me tend to be white guys who are more down than me. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. But that's in New York. Like, this is where New York City and pickup basketball are very similar, right? Like, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of like, whatever theories you might have about how race works, like, they don't work or matter that way in New York or on the basketball court, right? It's like, right. yeah, if that guy's open over there and he's on your team, you're gonna have to throw that lob or you're gonna lose. So 
whatever you think about this or that, like freaking throw the law, man. Like, like, and and the coach's freaking. point, like if you can't play, you're kicked off the court, right? It, it doesn't matter. Like yeah. you know, whoever you are, if your play is terrible, out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Actually, that's what makes me. Yeah, it's like a music. Yeah, go ahead, David. You get in. No, you're saying it's like music. You, a band's not going to rock out if there's one guy who just can't play his instrument, but he's got a nice one. Who cares? You got to be able to play it. <laughs> you know, one thing that comes to mind is the world that Coach Thorpe is in, organized basketball from the NBA down to junior high school and pickup basketball are actually very different games and require very different skills. One thing though that came to me in the Jordan documentary that I thought was interesting and that they share is the degree to which whoever you are outside of basketball does not matter. Correct. Like, Dennis Rodman is a great example of that. Yeah, and Jordan himself, like, yeah. he, I mean, in Jordan's case, there was, it almost feels like there hardly was anything outside of basketball, but you, it's what you bring to the court and that's the refuge of the whole thing. That's right. I, when I start saying basketball is my last vice, I think that's part of it. I used to play, or I still do, or whatever one uses past and present tense in this day and age, but <laughs> the university gym at Tulane, when I would play there, it was difficult if I had a problem, because these are college students and I'm a professor, mm -hmm. and I don't want to have that identity there. I just want to mm -hmm. be free to be as much of a dick as I need to be in that moment, but it, that would get a little tricky. And I, that was one thing about the last dance I thought was interesting about, you know, the the siloedness of my basketball life this is what we're here to do this is all that exists everything else disappears yeah yeah that's um i mean if you had to do some activity with a murderer or whatever like this is the thing to do right like this is a task that's so exciting and delightful and rewarding that you can do that task together right it doesn't matter what it's happens. better if the murderer is on your team yeah. <laughs> it is well it depends it, really is. It, it, it depends but yes typically yeah. yes can i ask uh, jared a question which is basically yeah, i'm curious you can you invert that question that you asked to mm -hmm. me or us you know like what's it like to be the white guy in a black but what's your experience with that being the being what the, the, the black guy only black person amongst the sea of white people <laughs> that would be the inversion has that it? ever yeah. happened to you <laughs> i mean that's everyday life right? I mean, <laughs> you just kind of motion through with you how about on the court uh on the court you know i played i didn't play a ton of pickup like when i was younger i was doing a whole bunch of other sports but when i did play um I was fortunate when I lived in New York, I grew I, around mostly black people and like first generation Americans, son of what sons and daughters of West Indian American people, like how a West Indian, like how I am. When I moved to the Burbs in New Jersey, I was one of seven black kids in my entire middle school. Right. So like that was very different. Um, and then to your point, David, it was about like, you know, suburban basketball in terms of like, this is how we play organized here and here versus, well, that's not how we play at the, at the playground, dude. Like, we're not, no fouls and no fouls here. We gotta, you know, and, and, and things of that nature. So it was, it was interesting, but what you learn early, oddly enough, is code switching, right? Like you, you, you learn how to fit in with this crew because when you're a kid, especially, there's nothing worse than standing out, right? Like, yep. it's like, that's like, oh, we, I don't want any of that. And there were obvious reasons why I already stood out, right? So you had to sort of figure out ways to, well, let's just kind of, make this not really a thing and just be like everybody right. else. But no, it's, right. whoo, it's crazy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we, we, we did a lot here today, I feel. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gerard. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, guys. Great to talk. All right.